Hello, I'm Dr. Asavari Manvikar. I would like to welcome you all to the CAR Global uh, Webinar Research Series. Council for Ayurveda Research is an international non-profit organization based out of USA and with a sister chapter in India by the name AAAF, Ayurvidya Anusandhan Abhiyan Foundation. Our mission is to encourage, educate, and facilitate basic and interdisciplinary research in Ayurveda. Our vision is to promote and establish Ayurveda as an evidence-based health science globally. You can learn more about us at www.ayurvedaresearchusa.org. Please do consider joining us as a member, which will bring you access to all our resources. No nonprofit can operate and succeed without volunteers. So consider joining us as a volunteer and we would love to place you in a variety of projects based on your skills and interest. Once again, our website is www.ayurvedaresearchusa.org. Now let me introduce our platinum sponsor, Komal Herbals. It's a company based in Pennsylvania. It's focused on the concepts of Ayurveda and the power of being healthy using herbals and natural products. Komal Herbals work hard to find premium ingredients for their herbal formulas. They also source herbs and spices that are sustainably and organically grown around the world. For more information, go to komalherbals.com. Now let me introduce our eminent speaker today, Vaidya Anupama Kichke Vaktil. She is an Ayurvedic practitioner, licensed acupuncturist, yoga teacher, professor, and director of Ayurvedic medicine department at Southern California University of Health Sciences. She currently serves on the boards of California Association of Ayurvedic Medicine, and the National Ayurvedic Medical Association. She is also president of Atreya Herbs, a US-based provider of Ayurvedic herbal supplements, and the vice president of Atreya Ayurvedic Integrative Health Center. She will be presenting on the topic, conducting and publishing survey research. Now, without further ado, let me hand it over to Dr. Anupama. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Asavari. Uh, thank you for your team and also Council of Ayurvedic Research for the invitation to present today. So let me go directly to the topic right now. Thank you. Give me one second. I'll share my screen. Mm -hmm. Are you able to see the... Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Give me one second. I think it is not. Oh, it's going to my second screen. Which mm -hmm. are you seeing my PowerPoint? Uh, not now. It was there before. <laughs> I don't know what happened. Give me one. Sure. Better? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So the topic for today is contacting and publishing the survey research. And so first I'm going to give a description about the type of research study, and then we will go more in detail about how to conduct the survey, what are the important things we need to pay attention before we do the survey research and then the planning and then how to publish the survey-based research study. So the if you look at the types of research study, we can see that there are two main category, non-experimental or observational study. The second category is experimental and interventional study. So under non-experimental or observational study, we have two main category that is population-based and individual-based. Survey study comes under population-based study. It's a descriptive and it's a survey. 
Okay, and the analytical type of study is an ecological study is an example for that. Individual based studies again, like case series, case report, and also analytic type. In analytic type, the cross-sectional study, case control study, and cohort study comes in. Under experimental interventional study, RCT and the non-randomized like quasi-experimental study comes in. So here you can see that the survey-based studies mainly kind of, it's a population-based survey research design, right? So what is survey research? Many of us might have taken survey research somewhere or other, either at our workplace or you know, even in the shopping mall, sometimes we, do, we see this type of studies. And it's very valuable, you know, very important research design. If you plan it properly, the data can be used for so many different you know, uh, project work. Actually, some of this uh, business, you know, uh, business, mainly depend on some uh, some aspect of the business also mainly depend on survey based research data right mm -hmm. so this is a very important research design and uh, so it's a defined as the collection of information from a sample of individual through their responses to question so survey research can use quantitative research strategies so mainly for example using questionnaire with the numerical rated items or qualitative research strategy that is using open-ended question or both strategies. So we will see the quantitative, qualitative, or some of the research study has qualitative and quantitative as well. So survey study can range from asking a few target question of individual on a street corner to obtain information related to behaviors and preference to a more rigorous study using multiple valid and reliable instrument and sample for the study. So large census survey obtaining information reflecting demographic and personal characteristic and consumer feedback surveys are very important example for that. So these surveys were often provided through the mail and were intended to describe the demographic characteristic of individual or obtain opinion on which to base programs or products for a population or a group. So now so the research method allow this information to be collected by asking set of question onto a specific topic or to the subset of the people, then we can generalize back to the population. So surveys are the principal method used to address the topic that require individual self-report about belief, knowledge, attitude, opinion, satisfaction. These are commonly used category, you know, the survey instruments are mainly used, commonly used this type of category, which cannot be assessed using other approaches. So even, if, even in the clinical trial, sometimes we have a survey based uh, instrument to evaluate patient's opinion or to evaluate patient belief system about the certain type of treatment. So the importance of the survey to design is, it's in as inexpensive to perform the study. Easy to collect the data. You don't have to, too many people involved in this, need to be involved in this. And it's very efficient. You can collect the information about the large group of people. And flexible, you can measure attitude, knowledge, prefer, uh, preference, belief, etc. It's very standardized. That is, it's less susceptible to the error. And if you if you prepare instrument properly, and if you have a valid, uh, reliable survey instrument, then the data are standardized. You know, there won't be much error there. And it is easy, uh, easy and inexpensive. It can be either administered through the online or paper survey. You know, there are so many platforms and different apps now available for administration and tailored to exactly whatever construct you want to study. If you are very clear about our objective and hypothesis, it's very easy to create a survey instrument more tailored to obtain the research questions to be answered, right? So we have to be very clear about the objective of the study, then we can get the specific data what needs to be collected in that study. Steps involved in conducting survey research, survey-based research. Uh, this is very important part, actually, I would say very important slide here. Anybody can do this survey-based research study. I don't think you, are, you have to be a 
uh, many years of research experience to do a survey-based study, I would say. So what are the first steps we need to pay attention? Identify the topic. We have to be very clear. What do we want to study about? Once we identify the topic, go back and do some literature search. What is out there about that particular topic? Is anybody all somebody already did a study about that topic? Already conducted some survey? What type of uh, how did they publish the data? What are the challenges they faced? What are the limitation of the study? You know what was the result? And identify a gap in the literature. So doing a thorough literature search help us to identify a gap and also to learn from their experience so that we don't want to repeat the same mistake again. And then once the literature search is completed, then you sit and write about the objective, what exactly you want to evaluate. And what is your expectation? What is your educated guess? That is a hypothesis, right? Then identify working team. You need a team of people to do. You just don't want everything to take care. There are some people who does by individual person completing survey-based research study. It's not impossible, but it's always good to work in a team and, and then identify the target population and formulate the sampling technique. You know, you need to uh, find out what, how much sample you need. You know, in, even though you identify a population, but you need a subset of the population to be studied. And you need to determine what will be the sample size needed to make sure your data can be more, you know, uh, more valid. So at this point, if you are doing a, re in a really bigger study, you can involve statisticians. So I recently completed a survey studies where I have to, uh, I have to send the survey to almost 2,500 people. In those, I, we had a biostatistician determining the sample size, what needs to be, what sample size we need to have to get the better result or to consider the result more valid. So then, then we can, once you have all this preliminary planning completed, then you need to create the instrument, survey design. That's where you need to spend more time. The creating objective will help you to identify what type of question to be asked, right? So that survey design is created. And then in that survey design itself, there are other steps comes in. You need to make sure, you know, validity of the survey instrument, you know, face validity you need to be done. And then, then you will do after everything is clear up and you make sure, okay, you completed the survey design, then you have to complete the ethical approval, institutional review board approval. And they will send you some feedback and then you will again revise your survey instrument and each feedback and comments make your study better and better. That's all how, how I look into, you know, before I did any type of the survey studies, I always send it to somebody else before I administer the survey so that, you know, there are no error in the instrument. Survey instrument validation. Uh, even after the ethical approval, you will do official, you know, validation of a survey instrument and then uh, survey dissemination, and then close the survey. You usually keep one month or you know, whatever time duration you want to keep it open. Um, and then close the survey, collect the data entry, cleaning the data, double verification of the data, analyzing the data, uh, sorry, it's, I said the date, it should be analyzing the data, and then write the manuscript and publish the study. That's it. If you know the structure, if you can complete this, then good to go. It's a very simple methodology, actually, among the research methodology. Surveys are very easy to, survey-based studies are very easy to perform. So first look at the survey title. This is very important stuff uh, because we want, when we send the survey, if you want the people to take care, they first they are going to read about it, right? It has to be very clear, easy to understand, and brief and up to the point. That is very important. So take time to craft a good title for your study, the survey. That will attract the people or that will motivate the people to complete the survey. Then you need to have a very good cover letter, introductory statement. Some people only read the cover letter and decide whether they want to participate in the study or not. And some, some of the survey, you don't have to be very detailed cover letter, a small one paragraph. So 
some studies, you know, really, because if the, your survey instrument is really large and, you know, government official type of survey or really grant related survey when you are doing, you want to make sure, you know, very detailed cover letter you have to craft. But make sure, even if it is a detail, try to be short as much as possible because nowadays everybody is busy, right? We don't have that much time and precise and not don't exceed more than two paragraphs here and should provide the purpose of the study. That's what everybody's going to read first. Why they are asking me to do this study? What is the purpose of this study? Should include the language about confidentiality. Very important. If I'm not confident about my opinion will be identified by my name, I may be biased. I won't tell my genuine opinion there, you know? So it's very important. We tell that in the first paragraph itself, it will be an anonymous survey. You won't be identified in the data collection. Very important stuff, actually. And can state that participation is voluntary. For example, if you are conducting a survey in, in, the, in the school level or in a university level, you want to make sure you know, students should not feel biased, oh, this faculty is conducting the survey, I should participate in it, otherwise I will be punished. No, we have to be very clear. Participation is voluntary. You won't be penalized if you don't participate. Your participation doesn't make any difference. You know, if you're interested, you can participate. And we need to motivate the participant to complete the study. Complete this, then only we get the data, right? So, so consent for participation and publication also very important. And it's very important that in the cover letter, we usually say that by completing the survey, you are giving the consent to publish, uh, participating in the study and publish the study. Very important part in ethical perspective. Usually IRB doesn't approve if they don't see all these statements. And add the, you should provide the estimate time. You know, it will take about 10 to 15 minutes or it will take about five minutes. That will motivate the people. Oh, okay, it's only five minutes, I can do it. Okay, and then you should provide, uh, yeah, add credential of the team who is conducting the study. Who all are the team members performing this study? And don't put too much technical jargon, you know, that will be difficult. And always thank your participant for taking the time to complete the study. So these are the major things to be included in the cover letter. Very precise, very clear, short, within two paragraphs, you can, but all the points you consider here. Then the second part is question type. Right. So now the cover letter is over. What kind of question we need to create? So we have our objective, clear objective here. There are different type of questions we can ask and we need to determine in order to get our objective to be answered. In order to answer our research question, what type of question need to be asked that we should know. So I'm going to go over types of questions in this category. Let's look at the open ended question. It's provide the participant with the opportunity to express themselves. It can be difficult to interpret or analyze. Open-ended question can be because it's like, you know, qualitative, right? It's, it's difficult to analyze, but there are certain software now, you know, you might need a specific software to analyze the qualitative data and the inter-rater reliability, which is already established, nothing new. We can use that, you know, sometimes we have to pay for it. And should be in a short answer format. You don't want somebody to write an essay to a question. Then it's so difficult to actually to collect that data in a quantified format, right? And then, so you don't want each participant yeah, write a whole page on topic. Respondents might be more likely to skip open-ended questions. That's very common, actually, I have seen. Uh, sometimes if there is an open-ended, they just skip. If they have to just mark round, circle, take, they just do it completely. That's very common later. And so you want to make sure, you know, maybe we can avoid open-ended question as much as possible, only use it where it is needed. Or it has to be that type of study where you have to, you can only do through the open-ended question. You know, the objective has to be such type where it can get the answer only through open and then go for it. Otherwise, use this type of question very less. And um, 
you might not get the responses that you were looking for sometimes you know people won't read the question exactly the way you want they may answer they go tell all all the stories about that so you won't get it exactly i feel like analyzing open ended question is really hard most of the scenario then the next one is closed ended so here you know the go type of go to for the survey question allow this one it may be more difficult to write if you have to take more time to write a, a, a closed end question compared to open end you have a finite set of response you may end up missing important information you know in the answer choice category there may be so many category we can involve in that scenario you may end up losing some of the thing if you don't involve in a closed end question but you know there is always an option to write others and then we can ask them to please explain or put that response all under other category which is not mentioned in the a b c choices so responses are easy to standardize and it's very easy you give the each variable you give a quantitative measurement and i can analyze it very easily like a scale is another one example so often of a rank option and each option is logically equidistant from next option so best is suited to measure the attitude perception belief all that this kind of category questions are very good so for example how satisfied or dissatisfied were you with the clarity of this presentation please indicate your response very dissatisfied dissatisfied neither dissatisfied or satisfied satisfied and very satisfied this is a very standard format when you choose the very you know this kind of category usually you keep it five five category two above middle and two below very much standard mm -hmm. and then uh, when you do the statistical analysis it is easy okay and then the next multiple choice measure nominal variable it's used when there are a finite number of op option it can include the option check all that apply as well okay for example which of the following classification best describe you faculty staff student if there are any other category which is not mentioned here you can ask the option other so they will select it okay so next one another categorical one it offers a category that is a nominal variable that may have no numeric order i'll explain the example so the respondent can belong to only one of a set possible set of possible category so what age category you belongs to so if you don't give the categorical answer you imagine how much data you will get if you are doing a survey for 100 200 people it's so hard right that's why here we need a category like 18 to 34 35 to 64 65 and over so anybody who comes above this they select answer choice c we cannot find out precisely the age of individual person but it doesn't make a huge difference right knowing 18 to 34 maybe we can put them together you know and the people who are declined to answer comes under d and then when you do the analysis you know you will if they skip the answer we will give another number their quantity analysis so it's easy to uh, enter the uh, have the analysis done properly okay so the next one is the ordinal category this is also really cool one it offers rank option here so but the distance between the rank is not uniform so it demonstrate the position of one variable in relation to a set of other variables it's often used to rank orders a list of item for example please rank the following order from one is favorite and four is least favorite so otherwise you need to if imagine you have to ask individual question is ice cream is your favorite or least favorite but that is your favorite so if you want to compare among the population or identify sample the category ordinal type of uh, data so you will give the answer choice ice cream potato chips pizza and apples and you will ask them to categ uh, rank the following so you will get x percentage people select favor ice cream was favorite in one question you can get that exam that answer 20 percentage of people are saying potato chips is favorite 30 percentage of people are saying you know uh, pizza is least favorite like that kind of answer it is easy to get from one question 
So you don't have to have too many questions there. So choosing, ranking the answer choice. Next one is interval variable. So here, similar to ordinal, but the intervals between the value of the response options are evenly spaced. It can be used for any quantitative variable, measure variables that fall into a logical range. Example, what, what was your undergraduate GPA upon graduation? So 3.5 to 4, 3.0 to 3.49, you know, 2.5 to 2.9, 2.0 to 2.49. So it's a logical range is there. It's not this, you know, every all over. There's a logical range between one GPA to another GPA. So it's easy for the uh, survey takers to answer the question, right? Again, another category is a numerical variable. Here, measure ratio variable, which are similar to interval variable. The answer must be a number, almost always an open-ended question. For example, if you choose to decide what is your height in English, if you want to be very specific answer, you can just say open-ended question. They will write it down. You have an option, put them into category. You know, all the people who are taking the survey between five to seven, six foot all in one category, then you can do that. Or if you want to be more specific, you can ask an open-ended question, numerical question, the same about the age as well. So now what I have explained so far, what type of question you can create in a survey instrument. It's, it's left to you to decide, do you like open-ended question? It's left to you in the sense, you know, always go back to your objective and decide what you want to ask. And then you, as if you, when you take the survey, what type of answer would make it more sense? And what type of answer make it more easier for readers to take it, you know? Always think in that perspective, while creating a survey instrument. And definitely you will be, before you administer to the sample, you will be testing it. So you will get the feedback. So multiple people, when they read that survey instrument, if they are getting what you want to ask, then it's good to go. So identify survey administration, then identify your population and specifically your sample. Plan accordingly to get the sample size you need to get the valid results. One of the biggest challenge, survey administration, you, how many people will complete the survey? You know, if it is electronic survey nowadays, people doesn't want to do it. You know, until sometimes if you give them some incentive or some kind of motivation to complete the survey, it's fine. Some tips for improving response trainer: you know, keep it more brief. Nobody want to complete a twenty-five page survey. Nobody have a time. You know, otherwise that's why some of the bigger corporate world they do that type of survey but they will pay the people to take the survey so that they can get the data there, you know, mm -hmm. but that need a funding. So consider offering an incentive. If you have a budget, go for it. And then method to reduce survey time. How will I, you know, uh, make sure that it doesn't take too much time? Make first thing is, you know, instrument should be short. You don't want too many pages. And how do we make it sure that it can be sure, you know, use multiple choice question, use drop down menu if you're on using online survey or check box, uh, slide, slider scale or open end so that way it doesn't go too many pages. So that is something I feel it more efficient. And then I, I talked about survey validation. Very, very important. If you are not using a valid validated instrument, for, for example, uh, stress related. There are certain survey instruments are already validated, which are available. Survey instrument for measuring the stress, uh, survey instrument for measuring the quality of life, survey instrument for measuring the pain, you know, SF36, SF12, those are the quality of life measuring scale. You know, there are a lot of disability scales are already validated. And so perceived stress scale, most commonly used among the university and college for measuring the stress. So there are so many survey instrument scale which are already validated. But if you are doing a, a survey on a topic which you know, nobody has done it before, and if there are no validated scale, you can use it. Validation uh, testing is worth effort. 
because that is something when we publish the research study, when somebody do a critical appraisal of survey-based research study, one of the question will come, is the authors or the researchers used a validated survey instrument? Okay, so the accuracy of the survey is determined by its validity. And how you, you know, you can, if it is not a validated instrument, you can say a constitute a panel expert or novice members do a face validity. And then you can make sure during that face validity, you stress on, on the content validity, make sure language is precise and clear and no error. Test retest validity, multiple people take the survey, have the similar perception or understanding the question in the same format and getting the data what you were uh, supposed to get it. Nobody's reading it in a wrong way. You know, if the, all the questions are very clear, you can ask that after the validation, you can create a summary question. How do they feel and get the comments? The people who are doing this for, or involved in validation of survey by doing pilot testing and check the functionality and logic and then take time to revise the survey instrument again. Okay. So that even though you spend extra time there, usually, you know, when I do the validation of survey, because everybody's busy nowadays, people never respond you back within a week. So it take another one month. It may add another one month into the project, but I do feel that that one month is worthwhile to wait for it because it will make your survey instrument precise, clear, and better, you know, very good quality. Then reliability testing also very important. If the questions in the survey are posed in a manner, so as to elicit the same or similar response from the respondent, irrespective of the language or constructions of the question, then the survey is said to be reliable. Similar like, you know, so the research study, reliability and validity is very important for any you know, research design. It indicates the consistency of the survey. This tend to be of considerable importance in the knowledge-based research, which recall abilities tested by making the survey available for answering by the same participant at a regular interval. So you can repeat the study. You know, generalizability of the study can be better once you can make sure that you know, the validity and reliable instrument is used. Generalizability will be much more easy. So it can also be used to maintain the authenticity of the survey by varying the constructions of the question. So now, so major task is completed. We, we made sure, you know, uh, what type of question to be involved. We identified the objective, we created the hypothesis. Now we finish the survey instrument and we kind of uh, validate it. And uh, before even we administer, send it to the IRB, we kind of make sure the instrument looks good, okay? And then we will do the survey, you know, uh, uh, you have to get the IRB approval. That is, if you want to publish this survey research, nowadays, mo most of them, I think every, every manuscript, every journal asks for the IRB approval, whether this study is got that. Without IRB approval, you won't be able to publish in a peer-reviewed journal, in my understanding, all the survey research. All the publication I are involved in survey-based research, they all ask the IRB approval for that. And then, uh, then the once you get the IRB approval, you, you have a two choice. You can officially validate and collect the data, and then you can have another publication there also. Validation of the survey instrument can be another publication. I actually did an, in the recent um, one of my research study, I, we did the separate study. I didn't publish it, but I presented that paper in another conference just to do a validation of a survey instrument. How did we do it? What changes we made, etc. But the, the next one, once you finish everything, you got the IRB approval. Now you want to administer the survey. So if you are using a paper survey, it's easy. You go with the paper, the, the sample, approach them, ask them to take the survey. Like for example, you are doing a survey in a conference. You know, whoever attending that conference in in-person, nowadays the conference can be online too, but in-person conference, you just give them, you get the answer immediately, right? That is easy. Otherwise, you know, social media platform, email, telephone, survey paper, survey smartphone app, electronic online and periodic rem And then another important thing is periodic reminder. To increase your sample, you know, response rate, you need to make sure that the reminder is needed. 
and the pro and cons to each of this method. Okay, there is, you know, there are plus and minus for each. Paper based survey, you have to enter the data everything manually. Whereas electronic survey, by the time they complete the survey, most of the uh, software, it will give the data by itself and they just need to cleaning the data, etc. But what I, since last, I think almost 10 years, I've been involved in a different type of, you know, I didn't do too many surveys, really, but in the whatever surveys I involved, initially I used to do a paper-based survey in the university student. But the response rate is more, much, much higher because you go to the classroom, you explain the methodology, you know, the objective, people are motivated, they all want to participate. Even sometimes I have got, you know, 100% participation rate. You know, when you go and explain about your survey, you are more enthusiastic, right? You, you can motivate them to participate and you can let them know that their participation, their opinion is valuable and how much important for your research study. That actually encourages them to complete the study. But when, whereas an electronics, some people, sometimes they won't even open the email if they find out it's a survey. Oh, there are so many things to get it done in a day. They won't have much time. So we neglect that. Actually, since I was involved in the research more, when I get the survey type study, I pay attention to it because I know how much time and effort that researcher might have put into creating that study, right? So you know that worth and so you participate in it. Uh, but I do understand every, you know, it's difficult to get online survey to be answered. And then tool for survey administration. There are so many survey tools, uh, you know, so go survey type performs so or survey, survey gizmo, survey planet, survey monkey, most commonly used. I have used survey monkey. Google Form is another commonly used platform. Survey Legend, Client Heartbeat, and uh, Red, uh, Red Cap actually. So these are the different type of the in, uh, platform where you can administer the survey. And each of this has a free and paid version as well. Paid version have a more uh, tools available for you to analyzing the data. For example, Survey Monkey, paid version and free version have a you know, limitation of uh, how many people can participate in the study and what type of analysis you can get it. So depend on the type of study and sample size you are targeting, you can decide the paid or free version. Then the next one, how can we increase the survey participant, plan for increasing survey participant? Keep the survey short and focused. Very important part, right? Many people will not answer long survey. So short survey will be very easy. And focus on the question truly necessary to answer the primary research question. And then try to avoid re you know, redundant questions there. Then use the survey very user-friendly. Make the survey more user-friendly. Poorly organized survey, difficult to follow, are not well received. People, they will do halfway through and then they say, oh, I cannot. Especially if you are doing a survey among the elder population, age 50 and above, there, are, there is some, uh, actually already a publication about uh, survey among the elder population, what needs to be paid attention to, like font size and in between the space, and very clear, all that. It's very important to encourage them to participate in the study and take the time for that and solicit suggestion from the volunteer reviewers, you know, as I mentioned earlier. Then generate a sense of importance for your study. I think I mentioned this. For me, this is a very important aspect and it really helped actually me to get more respond rate. Right? So people respond better when they believe the survey is important their opinion matters, it's valuable. So proceeding the survey with the letter or email, notifying the target audience in advance that it has the official support of the organization or emphasizing the importance of the project can improve the response rate. Uh, I did a recent another survey which is about the Medicare population. And it was about, so the, you know, elderly population, they are, they have more time, right? They are retired and they have time and they like to open it, read thoroughly, 
uh, they go through the document very precisely and i even get the letter when they mail the survey back it was a paper survey and they even write another paper comment in the uh, Uh, i'm so happy i'm participating because i you know this is medicare they should not do this they should do this you know they think that their opinion matters and they were thinking that it may go to the changing the policy level because the survey questions were similar to about the policy level type of study so that actually encouraged them to participate in the study so we need to create a story or we need to make sure create a summary statement which increases the which attract the people or motivate the people to complete the study next incentive small monetary gift like some people get starbucks or amazon card whatever you know uh, if you have it that will be that sometimes increases the participation and but again you know that depend on how much budget you have to conduct that type of research study Uh, study budget to sufficiently uh, unfortunately i didn't uh, my most of my study survey based is i didn't have a budget big a budget so it's difficult actually you know but then you know it doesn't have to be always you can say that uh, you can there will be at the end uh, the you know there can be some kind of lucky trip where you would be selected for the person who select get the free something you know it doesn't have to be all the members to trade really say that at the end of the, after closing the survey we will be doing some kind of uh, like a trip or something like that and then encourage them that may motivate especially the younger adult they like something to be okay i'll complete if i get this that they don't care about how much they they do care i don't want to say all population is like that but majority of them get attracted if they get a some kind of starbucks or amazon or itune or some kind of gift card that motivate them and reminder email another very important every survey that uses mailing direct postal or email distribution should plan on second or even third mailing to increase the response rate usually if i keep the survey i keep it open for one month then there will be reminder in between two reminder we do it so that encourage they should be built into the study plan and it should automatically happen you know not based on the result just you know if the survey is open for one month or 15 days you can reminder do a reminder a reminder phone call or reminder email or reminder postal mail once in seven days once in 15 days etc so in summary commandments of survey research start with the clear and precise research question very important if your research question is very clear if your object is very clear it's easy to come up with the survey instrument once the survey instrument is very clear and short and precise it motivate the people to participate and complete the study keep the survey focused and user friendly use validated question whenever is possible De- decide on open versus closed question format validate the survey instrument pilot test the survey instrument use proper sampling technique plan for low response rate if when you do the survey you open for one month that was your plan but all you find out that only 10 percentage of the people took the survey you know at that point you can extend it you know and if you inform the irb that the survey study is open only for one month you can do another application submit application to renew and to get the extension for the from the irb that is okay that is not something bad because you want to get a better response rate you know that is very important otherwise you know they may say the response rate is very small so the result cannot be generalized to the back to the population and that is quite challenging right so i just for non responders and do not over interpret the study result that's another important aspect so in summary what is survey research survey research is used to answer question that have been raised to solve the problem that have been posed or observed to assess the need and set goal to determine whether or not specific objective have been met or to establish baseline against which future comparison can be made or to analyze the trend across time and generally to describe what exists in what amount and in what context if you have if your research question need to be answered 
at this context, then survey-based research study will be a very good research design. Opinion matters, belief system matters, right? Demographic and you know all that type of category, you know uh, that type of question, maybe the best way to analyze can be the uh, survey-based research study. So these are my publication on survey-based research. I did it so perceived stress and fatigue among the doctor program students, prevalence of adverse, adverse effect among the students taking the technique courses. And um, so there are yeah, several research study, uh, survey-based research study I was involved in uh, past few years. Uh, only, uh, I think I was involved more than uh, 15 or 16 survey-based study and only published actually six of them. <laughs> but I have presented at a different conference those studies. And another survey study I'm just working on publication, I submitted and uh, just got the previewer uh, comments. I'm re uh, resubmitting it back in next week. So I think that's it from me. Thank you. Namaste. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was wonderful. Very, very beautifully explained. Thank you. Thank you. Very, very much in uh, detail and precise. Really wonderful. And it really reminds me, uh, you know, like when you do it in, in person, you definitely get a really good response because yeah. you can definitely motivate and your emotions and the way how you convey the, uh, the message is more stronger than how you do it over, like online. Yeah, online everybody is busy, right? It'll be one of one among the other emails, so we don't mm -hmm. pay attention. But when you go in person, you have a specific time, right? You will enter into the room and talk to them. They all are there. They don't have anything else to do. They are listening to you. You give the survey instrument, they take it, give it back. That makes the difference. Yes. Same. Absolutely. They say that some of the business survey. I was reading a one of the business journal. And they also reported that the survey, which is done in a shopping mall, when they do it in person, the response rate is more better than when they mail it to the people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's right. all everywhere, it's the same challenge. Excellent presentation, Dr. Anupma. Yeah. And I, it was good, content was good, but the zeal with which you present makes it enjoyable also. Thank you. Wonderful presentation. Uh, I have a question, but it is not related to the survey research. Uh, I just wanted to know, is there any place where we can go look up if we want to present case study, the information, how to format it, what are the things that we, like you, get, you gave the list that we need to check out. This, this, this is needed for a survey. These tools are there which we can use. Like that, do we have anything if we want to publish a case study? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can look at the critical appraisal form for a case, case report writing. Let me see if I can share. And also, you know, Dr. Ram Manohar, right? Dr. Yes. They have recently formatted a group or organization to help the uh, Ayurvedic doctors to publish the case report. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. I will reach out to him because I yeah. have a couple of cases where when they came to me, they came for the certain disease for which they came. Of yeah. course, we do not offer cure and treatment, but yeah. do see results. They came with the report that was positive. And after the working with me, those yeah. results came negative. So we need to bring it out to the world. Yeah, so yeah. If, if there is a way, uh, uh, see, I did my MD back in 98. We didn't even have the research methodology class at that time. <laughs> now yeah. it's introduced into the course and curriculum back yeah. in, in MD course. Yeah. So no, I, case studies can be extremely helpful, actually for the students as well as to reach out to more people. Because oh, for, uh, for us practitioners also, what we do to show the world that it actually works, we really need to bring that out and in a scientific way. So I definitely will reach out to Dr. Ramanohar if they are following this group. I, yeah. I think that is where I should be looking for. But if yeah. you have any resources, if you cannot find I it, can uh, share you the link you, also. There is. A, if you can email me later, that also would be helpful. Yeah, there are certain guidelines you can follow for publication of the case report. 
Mm-hmm. Because yeah, you are so vibrant in research field, so I was hoping to reach out to you if you could be helpful. Definitely, we definitely. all have our areas of expertise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? I am still learning actually. <laughs> okay. And see, I am even a, a step below where research is concerned. Yeah. I am good at clinical, especially I am good at women health. I can talk about that with confidence, yeah. but I do not have the same confidence when I'm talking about the research or the methodologies. We cannot be expert of everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I I just accept that my knowledge needs <laughs> to be more refined where the research is concerned. So every yeah. any help would be very helpful. Oh, definitely. There are different, um, you know, a critical appraisal scale for case report is there. And there are certain questions um, which you can follow through and make sure, you know, so definitely okay. I will send it. This is one thing. And the second thing is, regarding a pilot study, if we do not have good number to publish as a research, but we have a number to call it a pilot study. So what put, what should be the minimum number for a pilot study? No, you can, uh, is it ca- your main case reports? That is one thing. Case report is one thing. I case start- reports, case report, case studies different. You can also have a case reports. That means you might have treated same disease, multiple patients with a similar condition. And if more than one patient, two, three, four, you can write as a case reports and then publish it. Okay. And that is common. But if you're doing a clinical trial, you may want to do a feasibility study if the numbers are not. So you need to calculate the sample size. You may need to depend on the statistics. Exactly this I wanted to know. So if you're doing- How to get that? Yeah, so if you, for example, are if you're planning to do a clinical trial, randomized clinical trial or a whole system based clinical trial, mm-hmm. then you have a topic, right? Maybe you are doing a study on osteoarthritis, okay. something I'm just making. Yes. So at that time, you may want to, you know, you will have a statistician. You want to have a statistician to mm-hmm. decide what will be your sample size needed mm-hmm. to do a study on osteoarthritis in Ayurveda Mm -hmm. and they will be a better person because otherwise you may come up with the 5, 10, 15, we don't know that sample size. So so here comes the thing for a pilot study or uh, what was the other name that you said was? Feasibility. We call that that type of study as a feasibility study. That means it doesn't have to be sample size calculation. For feasibility study, you won't calculate because that itself reason is maybe I won't be able to reach the high sample Number. size yes. and then so I'm doing a feasibility study just trying whether this can be work or I want to know that Kaishoro Guglu is effective for the management of osteo I'm just making up osteoarthritis yes, or rheumatoid arthritis yes. so you just do a feasibility study you do the study among the 10 patients you know and then you just name it as a you don't say like you know uh randomized control you will say that randomized control feasibility study that's it okay and but again for rct when you divide into a two group you have to, you will, the numbers will be very small right yes category that's a challenge so but that you will explain study. that as the limitation of the study mm-hmm. and talking about when we are going to do this study there is a research methodology and then there are parameters that we study about right mm-hmm. So in modern medicine, there are scales for osteoarthritis, for menopause, for they have scales that we use for as a standard that these symptoms we are going to, these signs we are going to, or these investigations we are going to do. But we do not have similar set of uh, collective uh, signs, symptoms, or anything that we can call scale. So how my research would be considered standard if I include Ayurvedic parameters? You, you can still use it. For example, you will still ma- measuring the changes. You, for example, quality of life scale. Even if you do Ayurvedic study or in a biological study, you will use SF12 or uh, SF30, whatever you decide. Mm-hmm. But there are, you know, skin discoloration. There may be some scale already in biological So my, my question is that in that scale, sometimes they just feel better. So they, we just write plus, two plus, three plus or there are sometimes there is intensity. So how to, what no, it will be the, If you are using a validated instrument, mm-hmm. okay? That instrument come with how to use that instrument. 
and in were, case of ayurvedic uh, parameters when we do not have that skill i won't think i only maybe i'll see like on prakriti kind of form mm -hmm. may, but still somebody's already did a validated scale for prakriti for prakriti we have yeah, that yeah. sector so, has done and I, if any disease specific symptom very rare you may be using this i would recommend use the scale which is already validated scale to look at the changes Mm -hmm. don't try to create from the scratch then you may have to justify how this how, why how do you say okay. that it's the validation okay. so the way i usually do is go to chinese med they already way be in a front for yes. uh, research absolutely so they have already used some of the scale to mm -hmm. measure well they already validated some of the scale to measure the changes mm -hmm. in the symptom Mm -hmm. it can be skin rashes it can be itching or it can be stress scale it can be pain scale it's already there mm -hmm. so use that scale and you say uh, reference that to in it's, your study it's always wise to use the standard scale that already so has been validated validate especially if you are doing a clinical trial i would highly recommend that you use the validated scale mm -hmm. okay Okay. because otherwise it is you know when you write the paper you may have to say that it's is a you know limitation of your study because you have not used the validated scale yes. that that won't be considered as standard altogether yeah exactly yeah yeah yes. okay. so that's why using the uh, all i always recommend well even in the case uh, survey state studies also mm -hmm. validated scale is uh, if you have a survey instrument using mm -hmm. validated that is very important mm -hmm. got it okay thank you so much oh sure sure yeah <clears throat> thank you so much dr anupama it was absolutely awesome thank you thank you very much very well presented you and also council of ayurvedic research for giving me this opportunity to talk about this topic <laughs> thank you absolutely so please watch and subscribe to our video channel uh, for council for ayurveda research and uh, make sure that you like comment and share the videos you will be able to watch all previous videos at the uh, at the youtube channel and uh, please also consider for volunteering and if you are interested definitely reach out to us through the website and fill in the volunteer form there are lots of different projects we are working on Uh, as a part of uh, car and also uh, try to subscribe for our are you update newsletter uh, to stay tuned with our projects and also various events that we do throughout the year thank you thank you so much thank you namaste namaste